the Tudor Travel Guide and it's another big warm Tudor welcome back to this month's instalment of my A to Z of Tudor Places. Today we are heading northwest from London towards the Welsh border and we're going to be exploring a place which you could describe as being a playground of princes for it was at today's featured location that young heirs to the English throne were sent to learn the art of kingship as the head of their own princely household. Yes, folks, today we are putting Ludlow Castle in Shropshire under the spotlight. We'll start by learning something of its prestigious history and why this location was chosen to groom future kings and indeed queens of England. So, which Tudor royal or royals do you most associate with Ludlow Castle? I think probably most people would say Arthur, Prince of Wales, son of Henry VII and Elizabeth of York, who was sent to live at Ludlow alongside his new bride, Catherine of Aragon, in 1502. Of course, this is perhaps not surprising, since it was at Ludlow that Arthur died, tragically, only six months after his marriage to the fair Spanish princess. However, did you know that Arthur's niece, a young Princess Mary, also resided at Ludlow as the unofficial Princess of Wales from 1525? However, the Tudor heirs and heiresses were not the first to do so. In fact, the president had been set by the House of York when Edward IV had sent his two sons, Edward, Prince of Wales, and Richard, Duke of York, to reside at the castle. With such illustrious royal patronage, and on account of the historic events that unfolded there as a result of the death of Arthur Tudor, Ludlow is an extremely popular destination on any Tudor time traveller's itinerary, and indeed eminently worthy of our attention. So as usual, let's dive into a little about the origins of Ludlow Castle, which was actually put on the map by a notorious character from the 13th century, a certain Roger Mortimer. A Ludlow Castle was originally built by the de Lacy family shortly after the Norman Conquest in 1066. Perched up on a rocky promontory overlooking the River Teme, it's an imposing structure even today and is described by the eminent architectural historian Anthony Emery as arguably one of the finest Edwardian residences in England. And by the way, by Edwardian, he means Edward I. However, as I just alluded to, the castle was truly to reach its zenith under the ownership of the power-hungry Roger Mortimer who, having affiliated himself with the estranged wife of Edward II, Isabella of France, essentially seized power in England and became king in all but name. And Ludlow was the epicentre of his power base during that period, and Mortimer certainly held court there. In fact, it became a semi-royal centre with much feasting, entertaining and a procession of friends and guests. As a wealthy magnet of the time, Mortimer was responsible for adding to the existing Great Hall and Lower Chamber Block at the castle. And he commissioned the construction of an extensive and palatial second residential or upper chamber block, as well as the unusual chapel of St Peter. Well, we'll be learning more about these apartments in a moment, but suffice to say at this stage that according to Emery, the result was to create a, quote, magnificent group of buildings which were an outstanding example of their time and that its only peer was the Great Hall, Service and Residential Range added at Kenilworth Castle, which of course we talked about in last month's A to Z. Phew! Okay. So how did Ludlow become associated with the Royal House of York? Well, my friends, in the 15th century, as Earl of March, a young Edward Plantagenet inherited the property from his father. 
And so on his accession to the throne as Edward IV in 1461, Ludlow became the property of the crown. When Edward sent his own sons to live there, away from the foul air and machinations of London, that precedent I mentioned at the outset of this video was firmly set. And then for three generations thereafter, Ludlow Castle was to become the principal seat of first the Prince's Council and then later the Council of the Marshes through which the Prince and or Princess of Wales presided over their own mini court and kingdom, a kind of training ground for princes. This is how the lights of Prince Arthur came to be residing at Ludlow with his council from the age of seven. He returned to govern the marches as Prince of Wales, of course, with his new bride, Catherine of Aragon, in January 1502. But as previously mentioned, sadly their joy and triumph were short-lived when Arthur died on Saturday the 2nd of April in the same year, only months after their marriage. Goodness knows what Catherine must have been thinking and feeling as her entourage eventually left Ludlow and she wound her way back to London and an uncertain future. I suspect she wouldn't have dreamt that 24 years later her own nine-year-old daughter by her first husband's younger brother would be following in her footsteps and holding her own court at Ludlow Castle as Princess of Wales. But what about the royal apartments at Ludlow Castle? Well, what we do know of the place in which Arthur, Catherine and later Princess Mary would reside is that any royal party arriving at Ludlow would have had to make its way gradually uphill through the town across the bustling marketplace which no doubt was thronged with curious onlookers and then on under the 12th century gatehouse and into the precinct of the castle. So this gatehouse formed the principal entrance to Ludlow Castle as it still does today. In turn, this gave access to the vast outer bailey which occupied an area of almost four acres and was surrounded by the castle's curtain wall. In its day, this huge space housed stables, storehouses and workshops. As usual, the inner bailey contained the privy apartments at the castle and it was reached by passing from the outer bailey through an arched entrance which was next to the original Norman keep. And once through this second gateway, the residential lodgings were directly opposite built along the curved curtain wall. Begun in the late 13th and completed in the 14th century, these high status buildings were palace-like in their magnificence and comprised a series of interconnected buildings. From left to right, these included a three-storey solar block which extended into the northwest Norman Tower an adjoining closet tower, and in the centre a magnificent great hall, which in 1684 was said to be very fair, and then to the right of that, another three-storey residential block, sometimes referred to as the great chamber block or the upper chamber block. The principal rooms used by the most high status residents were on the upper storey of the solar block, accessed directly from the adjacent Great Hall by a spiral staircase or possibly by a staircase on the ground floor. Prince Arthur had occupied these lodgings during his sojourn at the castle and we might surmise that Princess Mary did the same. Perhaps Mary had even heard tales of her mother's time in Ludlow from Catherine herself or from her governess, Margaret, Countess of Salisbury, who had accompanied the 15-year-old Catherine to Ludlow in 1502. One wonders how she felt about being at the place where her beloved mother had experienced such elation, as well as such incredible sadness. Today, the apartments are in fact an empty shell. The rooms and the floors are 
gone, although in fact they did survive into the 19th century. The exposed stone walls, some covered in moss and lichen, look bleak and it's hard really to appreciate how Ludlow Castle could be viewed as palatial. However, it most certainly was in its day and the configuration of rooms into private suites heralded the latest in residential fashion for the aristocracy of the medieval period. And so today's time traveller must reimagine its splendour. The walls plastered, covered in rich hues of finely carved oak panelling, with expensive tapestries hung upon the walls, the chambers warmed and brought to life by flames dancing in the hearths of the many open fireplaces. Now the cause of Arthur's death is unknown. However, when his body was finally removed from the castle as part of the burial rites, it lay one night in the church, which can still be visited in the centre of Ludlow today. In fact, you'll see a plaque on the floor commemorating this very fact that his heart was buried in the church. His body was then conveyed by the royal manor of Ticken Hill, and this is where Arthur had been married by proxy to Catherine of Aragon before she came to England. And if you want to read more about that fascinating and much overlooked royal residence, do follow the link above, or you'll be able to find it in the description below. Anyway, back to Arthur. Arthur's body rested at Ticken Hill before continuing its sad journey amidst the foulest of weather onwards to his final place of burial at Worcester Cathedral. And there you can still see Arthur's tomb in the glorious Chantry Chapel. Well worth a visit. Well, the illness was to put a cat among the pigeons again when Princess Mary was in residence some 20 or so years later. There were concerns for her life as the plague had broken out in, quote, divers towns and places in these parts, unquote. Now, naturally, the desire was to protect the precious Tudor heir to the throne at all costs, and orders were promptly dispatched from London via Cardinal Wolsey to remove Mary to a lodged apart in some convenient place, standing in clean air with a convenient number about her. This duly ensued, with her noble grace being withdrawn with privy company in a place solitary because of the death, the plague, for introduction of the French tongue. So I'm assuming they were blaming the French for that. So how would a royal prince or princess have spent their time at the castle? Well, clearly they were expected to participate in certain ceremonies. Such participation would teach what was expected of their royal role. But outside of this, religion and studies must have taken up much of the time. And when not in the chapel, a good deal of time would likely have been spent with tutors or spending time with companions, learning the pursuits befitting a royal prince or princess, such as hunting, hawking, dancing and playing musical instruments. Then on Sundays and holy days, Prayers and services were held in the Norman Chapel of St Mary Magdalene, which is sited in the inner bailey of the castle. Sadly, Ludlow's prominence declined with Mary's departure. The council was shortly thereafter disbanded permanently, and never again would a prince or princess of Wales preside over their father's dominions in the marshes. So that concludes our little history or Tudor history of uh, Ludlow Castle. But what about if you want to visit? Well, I'd like to share some of my top tips for visiting Ludlow and its castle. And it is indeed a lovely place to visit, not least because the town, which sits adjacent to it, is a bustling market town. Very pretty, quite quaint, with a market held in the market square directly in front of the gatehouse of the castle. It has a real oldie worldy feel. And if you love food, why not try and coincide your visit with the renowned Ludlow Food Fair? And in usual non-COVID times, 
there's also a medieval Christmas fair which is held in the outer bailey of the castle. Well, the castle itself is fully open even in these Covid sensitive times as it is a ruin and therefore is outdoors. So unlike many of its enclosed historic counterparts, you can still visit and no booking is currently required. Now, as I mentioned earlier, do make sure if you're visiting Ludlow to take a trip to the charming little parish church, which is tucked back of a tiny alleyway from the high street. And do look to combine your visit to Ludlow with a pilgrimage to Worcester Cathedral, which is about half an hour away in the car. And then finally, if you want to read more about Ludlow and many other Tudor places of note, do be sure to pick up your copy of my co-authored book In the Footsteps of the Six Wives of Henry VIII, which features around 70 locations associated with the Queen Consorts of Henry VIII. And Ludlow, of course, is included in that book. And you'll find a link to find out how to purchase the book in the description below. So my friends, that's all for this month's A to Z of Tudor Places. I do hope you've enjoyed our exploration of the wonderfully historic Ludlow Castle. It is such a popular destination on any Tudor time traveller's itinerary. And so I will leave you there and just send you good wishes for all your Tudor adventures. And I look forward to seeing you on the road again next month for our next episode of our A to Z of Tudor Places. Until then, my friends, happy time travelling. Thank you.